Robertson. The other day we had a free clinic and, and mom walked in with her baby and, and, and I said, Teresa's going to treat your baby. And she hadn't met I think, either me or Teresa. And, and she said, oh, I, I really wanted you to treat my baby. I said, no, you don't understand. Teresa's like the second most famous cranial sacral practitioner in, in Portland for treating babies. And, and she's like really good at it. So like, honestly, you're in good hands. And so she was relieved. And, and indeed, she thanked me for that you know, later. And um, Teresa took the very first class that I ever taught. Teresa has taken every class that I have ever taught, not every session. <laughs> and in fact, if I made up a class about how you could stick, I don't know, toothpicks in your ears to, to get insomnia, <laughs> Teresa would sign up for the class and take it. And so she's taken the, the information that I've taught and like totally run with it. And, and over the this what is it, five or six years now, uh, Teresa has built um, a fabulous pediatric bodywork practice and, and is treating a lot of toddlers. And people have been asking me, Carol, 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 you've got to teach a toddler class and I don't have time to put it together. This woman is putting that class together. I'm really excited. <laughs> And our community is going to be like totally stoked because there will be free toddler clinics that go more associated with it. And, 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 and the, the need for, for treatment for kids in this age range is so great. It's a time when parents are beginning to realize there's something not exactly right with Johnny and we got to get, we, we need some help. And, and, and so now we're going to start to get some people really specifically trained to offer that help using these kinds of tools. And I'm so happy that you're going to teach us something about it. So anyway, welcome Teresa. Here we go. Thank you. Thank you. So my background is I've been a massage therapist for 20 years. Um, I went the deep tissue route for about 11 of those years. And I love all the um, stretches and the release moves that uh, the chiropractors have been showing, and uh, they're fabulous. Um, just for uh, taking care of my body, I finally moved into the lighter work. Um, that deep work is a lot to sustain daily, weekly, monthly, or yearly. And so the cranial circle just really afforded me a way to keep working as a body worker. Um, and so I was just, I was a patient of, of Carol's for a while, which was lovely. And that's how I came to meet her. And um, that was about the time she was developing the infant class. And so I was, I was totally on board with that. I studied uh, to be the infant massage instructor, but um, that really never took for me. So uh, once I could actually get my hands on babies and do some therapeutic work, um, really sunk in for me. And um, I'm also a certified fitness instructor, a new instructor. And so I, I treat um, all levels and all ages, so I still have a good adult clientele. And I uh, do a lot of cancer care and movement therapy for them. Um, that's just another field I think we need a lot of education in, um, recovery from surgery from that. Um, and so, um, as I started, I do in-home treatments for babies. Um, babies under six months, I go to the homes, and I just kind of really started to see that um, there was this toddler piece, you know, because oftentimes you've got a toddler right there, and what can we do for them, and so that's how I kind of progress into starting to work with that. And so I see toddlers in my office. And what I'd like to do now is kind of get everybody on the floor and maybe experiment with what it's like to be in that little body again. <laughs> so if we could kind of form um, two lines uh, facing each other and have you um, standing at first. So shoes on or off, that doesn't matter. I'm just gonna... No shoes off. Oh, we're done with yoga. So well, no since we're passing, I like shoes on. Okay. <laughs> so I'm going to have every other person <coughs> sit down. And if we can start with Nanda. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Not They're much more organized than your life. Oh, uh, no, I'll stand. Oh, wait, no, I'll sit. <laughs> and, you know, really without saying anything, I want the person on the floor to just kind of feel what that 
feels like to be in this group of people that are way taller than you and you need to look up to them to um, engage in their eyes. <laughs> and then four hours switch. So let's uh, get that experience. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Does anybody have any comment <laughs> what that felt like? It occurs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It hurts. Anything else? Intimidating at all for anybody? I'm being it. <laughs> it felt kind of safe too to have like these big towers around. Nice, very nice. Yeah. Yeah. What's that? I think it depends on the personality. Like for some Absolutely. people it's safe, and for some people it's like imposing. They're like, hey, right. get me. Right. <laughs> I can imagine too, taller. Can't put that together. No. You know, they're they've just, never had this experience. Yep. They only have this experience. That's their way. Right. So and I notice the lights too. Like usually when I'm up high, I don't you don't see the lights or look into them. Yeah. Yeah. So this is just a way to kind of start to be mindful when you're working with these little ones. And then imagine um, as a practitioner, how are you gonna approach them? So if you kind of look to the person to the right that's sitting next to you, you know, and that little one's coming into your room. What are you going to do? <laughs> nice. <laughs> Yay, <Yeah, they're insane. laughs> And for that person that was sitting being the taller, what did that do for you? That's great. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Like they're really trying to talk to you. Yeah, like you matter. Very nice. So we, we won't switch on that, but you um, guys okay. So the next thing we're going to do is everybody's going to come up onto their knees, if that's comfortable for you, because I realize you know, some of us got knee issues and stuff. And this is a little older child, so, you know, three, you guys are tall. Three <laughs> four. You're starting, your world's starting to grow up, and I'll have every other person stand, so we can kind of get that idea. Easier on your neck. Yeah. yeah. Definitely. So then if we just switch real quick. You can get your exercise for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> the movement thing will be here. Any, any other comments on what that feels like for you guys? This is great. Uh, <laughs> I like that. I like that. Did we switch? Oh, yes. <laughs> for you, take a few steps with your knees, with your hands to your sides. And not moving your shoulders, not engaging oh. that movement. This is real limited, but it's gonna start to incorporate into your body. And then move back and we'll switch.
<laughs> and then everybody could stand over, right? And just anybody have any comments on what that felt like? Really long yeah. arms for the short legs. Yeah, and the knees yeah. is really tough. So <laughs> we're doing the best we can. <laughs> well, that's a little bit about how walking develops, and we'll go into that with milestones. So um, you'll kind of hopefully feel that when I talk about that later. So the next thing we're going to do is we're going to come back down to uh, sitting or kneeling, whichever is comfortable for you. And
Next, they're going to learn to walk alone. This happens at 11 and a half months to 14 and a half months, approximately. Area for therapy concern, weight bearing on feet. Initially, has that widened base of support with the external rotation of the hip. The arms are at high guard. And we played with that a little bit. And we found that as we bring them up, kind of stabilize our hips. I think that's what we felt. Then they're walking fast, and now they're on the move. 15 to 30 months, their concern is the weight bearing is on that single foot at one time. The base of support will narrow. External rotation of the legs will decrease. Arms will move down from high guard, affording the child the ability to acquire objects in their environment. So we brought our arms down, <coughs> and we started doing that cross arm and leg movement. We, hopefully you guys kind of felt a little bit that your knees narrowed in and that base of support changed for you. So I do get a fair amount of kids that um, aren't moving through their milestones very well. Um, you know, they were maybe the late crawler, couldn't quite get that one leg going, come in, have a treatment, and get a nice text that they're moving the next day or within a couple days. Um, this can happen with the walkers as well. You know, they're just, they're using that support forever. They, they just can't get that one leg moving. And so, again, it's usually one session that can kind of make that great change. So I kind of lump these all together, the social, emotional, cognitive, and communication. But about one to two years, it begins to play by themselves for short periods of time without needing the parent to interact so much. They begin to play with others independently. And children in this age range become more self-aware and go through that stranger anxiety and separation anxiety. And parents have to break for that. Um, just calms their nervous system down. Just helps them move through that milestone again. They learn through exploration. They understand and respond to words. And they follow simple directions. At two to three years, they begin cooperative play. They enjoy imitating adults, their facial expressions and actions. And they express affection warmly. Engaging and appreciative. They sort objects by category, they can name objects, and speak in two to three word phrases, and gradually learning to form their sentences. <laughs> yeah, so how do we work on that moving target? We move with them. What you're going to need to um, think about is adapting your workspace. Try to work in a smaller area if you've got a larger office. Like just, I have a corner of my office that I try to contain them in. So they, they're going to be on the move. And so I just move with them. And I've got a hand on them for a while here. Then they sit down. I might sit down next to them for a little while. And they're going over here. Work in a different area of their body. It's uh, definitely a work on what you can get to environment. So, if you're real protocol oriented, um, it's probably not going to fit in so well. <laughs> um, so, you're going to allow the child to go back and forth to their parent, you know, so there's a lot of that reassuring they might need to do. Um, work on them, they go sit with mom, we talk a little, we play a little, hands back on again. You can stand next to them and uh, work on their head very easily. <coughs> I find that I do that a lot. You can sit next to them on the floor. Um, you can sit next to them on the massage table. Um, and then you can work on them in the parent's lap, which is super adaptable. So older toddlers may want to get on the massage table. And just always be um, mindful that they can move really quickly. And usually I have a parent sitting pretty close to them, so, uh, you know, so they're not going to roll off. Then they might want to be still for about 10 minutes, then they might want down, then we're back on the floor, then we're back on the 
the table. I tend to move a lot in my practice. <coughs> it's great to enlist the parents' help. They're usually super about it. You know, they, they um, try to be very mindful about bringing their attention to, you know, let's, let's play right here for a little while, or can we color a book? Having an assortment of the age and milestone appropriate toys handy is that great benefit. So you might want to stock up on some picture books, some puzzles, crayons, stuffed animals, building walks, reading books, all that kind of stuff. So then again, you, you work on them while they're doing those activities and you have the parent help. So again, having the toys available, letting the kids move around, because you, the therapist, the view and how they play, how they interact, and how they physically move. So we all kind of know that um, gaining a child's trust is really important, and especially before touching them. But we all try to appreciate that in any of the work that we do, any age range. But one of those ways of doing that is making that eye contact, coming down to their level. Hopefully we all kind of experience that. I want to talk with them a few minutes before you get into the therapeutic part of it. You know, I spend time just chatting with them, getting down on their level, playing a little bit, and then I start coming into therapeutic mode. And I do ask their permission to gently touch them. And if they say no, I don't do it. So I wait a little while, I chat with them a little longer, and then we ask again. Sometimes parents will get involved, and if they say, you know, is it okay if Teresa just kind of lightly touches you, then you know, they think, seem to think it's okay. Mom says okay. I find that parents will say, well, I'll just hold him in my lap. I'll hold him still for you. And I have uh, to really talk parents through, like, no, it's okay. Yeah. That's not going to help. No. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good point. So at first you can name where you're going to touch. So, you know, I'm just going to touch you lightly on your knee. Is that okay? Or I'm going to touch the back of your head for a little while. Is that okay? And then take a break from treatment and play with them, uh, then do more treatment. I mean, I think those breaks are pretty crucial. They can integrate so much. So, And if they're not wanting touched, you play with them and do the hands off work. So I may have them sitting on the floor facing away from me. They're engaged with what's in front of them. And then I come in behind them and start the energetic work. And really, you know, within a couple minutes, I've got my hand on them and they don't even know I'm there. And from then on, I don't ask permission if I'm moving to a different body part or anything. We just start doing the work from that point. So signs of them not wanting to be worked on or saying no, they're going to move away from you. Um, you know, if I'm sitting next to them and I kind of reach out, they'll scoot away. You know, <laughs> I'll follow them. <laughs> I just kind of keep getting getting in there. Um, they can brush your hand away. You know, you've got your hand up by their head, they're, they're moving you away. You know, they're pushing you off their leg. I might come in with the other hand. You know, they can push this one away as much as possible. But this other hand's getting in there and getting some work done. Um, they're going to turn their head from side to side, you know. Mm -mm, mm -mm, I, don't, I don't want that kind of thing. Um, and then crying, but I, I really don't get the toddlers crying much, you know. But some of them, that might be their way of release. So sometimes you just need to be patient and persistent. So a lot can be done with just a little in cranial sake, but we know. So again, it's not that I got to have my, hold my hands here for so long and really feel that pattern and that release lighter you are and the quicker you are sometimes that happens much quicker and it's going to happen quicker in infants or um, young kids. So I do a lot of work with um, what's now termed pervasive de developmental disabilities and this is defined as a diverse group of mild to severe chronic conditions due to mental and or physical <coughs> impairments. So those milestones that we just kind of talked about, they're going to be delayed. And they can be delayed in language, mobility, social behavior, and learning. The onset and duration of these disabilities can begin at any time during development, from 
prenatal up into adulthood. The disability usually lasts throughout a person's lifetime, maybe. <laughs> you know, a, with a lot of great care that's out there now, we've all talked about all the integrated care. Um, people can really be in a manageable stage now, depending on the, the severity of the condition. The diagnosis for these is typically based on a questionnaire of highly subjective information to categorize patient's signs and symptoms. These diagnostic criteria are highly subjective and vary. So there's just no one way of labeling what condition they have. And I might say this a little later, but all of, all of these things kind of overlap in these developmental disabilities. And the literature that's out there has really progressed over the last 10 years of really identifying what specific subgroup you're dealing with, but it's really confusing. Um, the labels, I think, are confusing, and so you might get a kid in that says, you know, he's been diagnosed with, you know, sensory processing disorder. Um, well, that, that spills over into all the others. So I really find that the diagnosis is just an idea of what's going on. And I'm not looking to cure a condition and the medical field really isn't looking to cure this condition either. They just are really looking what's going to support these individuals. So again, there's no physical examination or laboratory test that can definitively confirm many of these disabilities. So the people that are out in the environment that are really identifying kids with these conditions other than the parent are of course who they're in contact with and one of the first lines of defense I like to call it are school teachers you know, they're, they're getting really good education now um, there's a great book called uh, the out of sync child written by a teacher that um, has done um, wonders I think for getting the word out um, so daycare providers they're probably not as informed, but they're the ones that are going to see it, and they're going to report back to the parent that, you know, Susie just is like this daily. Because a lot of times, you know, parents see it, but they're not sure it's a concern. You know, they just think, well, they got a busy child, or so-and-so just likes to wear his clothes a certain way, and we're all particular, and that's true. We all exhibit parts of these. Mm -hmm. And um, there's another statement I'll say in just a second. So um, again, the family member or friend whose own child is diagnosed with this, you know, they can be a great source of help um, because it is really confusing on where to go and where to get the information and who should go to first for treatment and what kind of treatment is out there. The only concern of that is not everybody's the same, and so you can't go by, you know, what that person says exactly worked for their child. You have to investigate <coughs> for yourself. So proposed causes, environmental toxicities, which home schools, businesses can be a source of exposure to heavy metals, molds, and chemicals, byproducts, and pollutants. The allergic reactions to food, dyes, and additives, many physicians, right in this room here, probably recommend following elimination diet, avoiding certain foods, the artificial sweeteners, hydrogen and oils, in conjunction with the nutritional supplements. That getting kids on the anti-inflammatory diets and using the supplements that are going to support that, we really do make a difference. It's, it's kind of a big team effort with these conditions. Um, so the biomechanical restrictions and neurological restrictions, the way we look at it, cranial bones become torque deviated or compressed. You got your fascial restrictions. You know, I really love showing this one to parents. I just say, you know, see the lines in my shirt? That's what your fascia is doing. It's gotten stuck and it's not moving and you can feel how it doesn't move on you. So the inside of you is moving in a similar way. And then we can, of course, have nerve impingements that go along with that. So one of the 
big ones is that compression of the jugular foramen and the structure of passing through it. So in this one, we've got this rectus capitis muscle and under the stylar process in the jugular foramen. I love this photo because you can see how the atlas meets. And we get a underside view. So there's the condyles, the magnum. And you know, we got all these other ones. Lots of nerves, blood vessels going through. Then again, this is a great view here. You can see right where it meets up. So whenever there's an occipital compression, there's an associated tightening of the rectus cap. See how they go from the occiput to the vertebrae. So some of the sources of these restrictions, we all know Carol's great work with birth and what's going on with the jammy in that area. Um, falls and physical accidents. I do get a fair amount of kids in my um, treatment room with falls and accidents. And some pretty severe ones that, um, you know, well, they bong their head, but, you know, they hit their head pretty hard. And next thing you know, we've got the molding of the bones over here, chronal sutures starting to jam. This is starting to jam. Seizure disorders, well, you know, so much muscle spasticity is really, really compromised that area. Um, I get a fair amount of abuse kids in my treatment room. Um, physical, emotional, and sexual, either independently or a combination thereof. And we all know the compensating patterns of that. Um, you know, hyper, uh, hyperactive body system, tightening all the time, they can't relax. Recovery and adaptation from the surgeries, and other birth defects and some illnesses, and fevers. So, of course, there's lots of. So I want to talk about sensory processing disorder. So it's also known as sensory integration dysfunction. They don't use that term too much anymore. But the effective sensory processing is the ability to organize sensory information for use in our daily life. So sensory processing means taking those sensations of touch, vestibular information, sight, proprioception, temperature, emotions, and the world around us, and then respond in a well-regulated way. Good luck to everybody on that. <laughs> <laughs> so this input is from our environment, and it's taken into our senses via receptors, then sent through the nervous system to the brain to be processed or perceived to create a response. Sensory experience drives our behavior and contributes to the organization of our thoughts. For children, this means how their activities of play in school and home. The sensory information, the sensory processing disorder, the central nervous system is ineffective in processing this information. Mm -hmm. This dysfunction can be in one area or in a combination of sensory registration, sensory processing, and sensory modulation. So a child's sensory system can be under-stimulated or over-stimulated due to their inability to continually modulate those experiences. Take it in, see what they feel about it, what they want to do with it, does it bother them, do they even notice it? So an example is the amount of tactile defensiveness or adverse response to light touch. So that's such as tags and clothing, being touched by others, participating in messy activities. These are oversensitive stimulations. So the difference in not just liking something, you know, we all don't like something, you know, we don't like the way something feels or um, the sound of something. And that of sensory processing disorder is that the oversensitivity leads to the fight or flight response. Mm -hmm. And then the adverse compensation behaviors. And some of those behaviors are the inability to interact in groups, 
play one on one with friends, difficulty standing in a line between other children, overwhelms them. They just can't do it. Having their hair washed or bathed, you know, they don't like that touch. A lot of these kids are, um, they don't have good temperature control. They think a mild bath is really hot and they won't get in it. Um, a lot of them hugging too hard because they, they don't have that feedback system. They think, oh, everybody likes this, you know? Mm -hmm. And then yeah. as kids don't like it, they don't come around that kid. Then they become isolated and it just creates this whole loop. So other SPD responses are being overly fearful, clumsy, being continually tense, being unhappy because of their view of life, the constant states of confusion. So they're going to withdraw, they're going to be aimless, they're going to have low self-esteem, they're going to be overly shy. They do not feel safe in their world. And that's a really big thing to take into account when they come into your office. It's overwhelming for this is a really big new experience for them. They don't know you. So you're going to spend extra, extra time meeting those boundaries. So they're going to have learning disabilities. And this is really key. It is not from lack of intelligence, but their processing ability. These kids are super smart. Super smart. They take it in, they know what to do, it just doesn't come out how they intended it to. So then we have autism and autism spectrum. So it's a really confusing history. Autism was first recorded in the 1930s with very low rates. Approximately 1 in 10,000 children were diagnosed. Starting around 1990, the cases of autism began to increase enormously. In 2003, the rate of autism was 1 in 150. As of this year, the CDC now states that 1 in every 88 children will be diagnosed with the autism spectrum disorder. It's huge. So the diagnostic rate is dramatically on the rise from 12 to 15 percent per year. The latest CDC report also states that autism spectrum disorders commonly co-occur with other developmental or psychiatric, neurological, chromosomal, and genetic diagnoses. So there's a lot going on with these kids. It's not one thing, it's a combination of things leading up to their particular condition. It occurs in all racial, ethnic, ethnic and socioeconomic groups. Mm. It's almost five times more common in boys, one in 54, and in girls, one in 252. Hmm. Carol might have a good on that. I don't really have a clue. Do you? I boys. Yeah, why boys, so are girls. Developmental systems are... No, in, in general, they are more fragile. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the development of the data and testosterone and more boys have disabilities because they... Some people think because of the, the time that testosterone is introduced in utero and if there's something off balance, it's more unstable. Wow. Okay. That's the most common thing I've heard of, like, why, but, yeah. you know. Maybe. So is the general thought that the rise of autism is that we're becoming better at diagnosing it, or the numbers are going up, or both? That's a really good question, and it's both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm curious also about... Possible misdiagnosis and confusion between um, sensory processing disorder and the autism since a lot of the symptoms seem to overlap. Right, and so she asked the, about the confusion of the or the misdiagnosis of these, and I don't know if that's super important because I, I think mainly the medical field is trying to treat more on an individual basis, is just what I've seen. I don't know if anybody else has a better idea about that, Allison? I 
I think that this is a horrible misdiagnosis. It's a garbage term. Yes. And it is keeping us from being able to ferret out what is really going on yes. and what the appropriate treatments are. Yes. And to lump these kids into a category called autism spectrum right. disorder is tragic. Yes. Mm -hmm. And I'm, I'm uh, along with nipple shields, it's a scourge. <laughs> <laughs> Ouch. A lot of times parents will push for it so that their kids can get services in school. So that's, I think, one of the main reasons why it gets diagnosed because the doctors want to help the kids in schools. And so the only way they can get help is that the they have that diagnosis. Well, and the question of it is, I mean, there are standardized assessments to feel if you really have autism. And, and I, I can guarantee you that not everyone's getting an ADOS. Mm -hmm. yeah. so. Well, they use different. Thanks. They use a lot of different. Like, right. Yeah. So, so there is a standardized one. Yeah. 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 ADOS. Mm -hmm. but, but it's done by doctors in developmental clinics. So if you do, you know, if there is a real thing, you should really, really get the diagnosis. And still, your approach to treatment is going to be the same regardless. Mm -hmm. so. And our experience around here is that it's really hard to get that diagnosis mm -hmm. uh, because uh, they don't want to label those children. We have children in the school systems that we are like, this is a child that is on the autism spectrum. And it is really hard sometimes to get that diagnosis for them. And early intervention, you don't have to have that diagnosis to get services through the schools. Up through age nine, you do not have to have that diagnosis to get age through schools. You can be just developmentally delayed. It is at age nine when the categories for disability change. And so at age nine, often there is when they might be diagnosed because they do need it for sometimes for services at school. But um, there's a big difference between kids who have sensory processing. Yes. We, you know, you, there's a big difference between kids who are on the autism spectrum and sensory processing mm -hmm. and how they are reacting. So it's pretty obvious and the, like, the people in the schools are really good, especially the teachers, like she said, at being able to decipher, now this kid has just got some sensory issues going on and this kid is really, <coughs> out here doing well, we something We also different. need to define what are we saying autism is, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Because it's a social, that. emotional, affect, or regulation problem. That's yes. all. There's nothing to autism other than that. They used to find, like, they were looking and they saw cytoarchitectural differences in the cerebellum. So they were looking at organic brain differences, and there are those sometimes, and then there aren't sometimes. So, yeah. So, you know, I found it in, in my research, it was very confusing. So, you know, even some of the stuff I put up here, you know, take it with a grain of salt because, you know, yeah, there's no agreement yet. Yeah, that's really weird. Thank you, everybody. Um, well, there it says, you know, I, and I don't know what you say about that, it shows, you know, tend to occur more often if people have certain genetic or chromosomal conditions. Sure. Yeah. Makes sense that kids with genetic and chromosomal abnormalities have trouble interacting, communicating, and playing. So again, this, the spectrum encompasses these related disorders that have similar symptoms of poor communication skills and social dysfunction. Um, some say that Asperger's syndrome, ADD, ADHD, uh, with the most severe than being labeled autistic. Yeah. Well, I just say something about the ADHD. Yeah. <laughs> so. You know, we got all this new research that is um, uh, lack of delta sleep can appear as ADD or ADHD in particular. So there, it's now becoming more popular to do a sleep study with these kids. Thank goodness for Daniel Amon, who's done the spectrographic studies and been able to help to pinpoint this. So, you know. It's, this is why I think this is a travesty, because it's keeping us from looking at what else could be going on with these kids. Mm -hmm. And sometimes these things are just simply because of the primitive reflexes have failed to either emerge completely or integrate completely. And so just doing some work with that can sometimes make a diagnosis evaporate. Mm -hmm. So I think we have a real opportunity as cranial sacral therapists to not just accept the label and to go, wow, body, show me what you need. Exactly. Yeah. 
I know. know. I don't go by the label. Yeah. At all. I mean, and, and along with that, I would encourage you all to look up Moscatova method and rhythmic movement training because these are two cutting edge approaches that integrate beautifully with craniosacral therapy that can help your cranial work integrate into the body better. And simple skills to learn. Can you repeat those names? Moscatova, M A S G U T O V A <sighs> method. And you can just Google that and you'll go to her website. She's a psychologist from Russia. And then rhythmic movement training, which is Harald Blomberg's uh, approach that he's formalized. And that's H A R A L D. B L O M B E R G, and um, and these trainings are taught all around the United States, so they're accessible. Thank you. Great, thank you. Yeah. <coughs> well, what the research that I read does say that specific to autism is the delay or abnormal functioning before the age of three in one or more of the following areas: of social interaction, communication and having a repetitive, restricted, stereotype patterns of behavior and interest or activities. So again, autism has categories of high functioning and low functioning. The difference from other forms of autism have led many psychiatrists to consider high functioning autism similar to Asperger's syndrome. So again, Asperger's syndrome is another category. They're taking that off of the uh, DSM, so it's not ah. going to be a diagnosis. Okay. Yep. Oh, that's great. It's not going to be a diagnosis. Yeah. It's just going to be autism. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. Many physicians believe that autism spectrum should be diagnosed before, early, before age three, to provide the best opportunity for treatment. Um, no known cause, we couldn't talk about. Maybe other factors can be linked to the symptoms. Genetics has also shown to be part of the importance. So we can start at any point during pregnancy or infancy while the brain is still growing. So in the book, The Brain That Changes Itself, Dr. I may want to say that. <laughs> He's quoted the saying that with autism, he believes something might be going wrong in infancy. With most, when most critical periods occur, plasticity is at its height, and massive amounts of development should be occurring. But whatever the cause, we know there is undue stress in the brain and the nervous system. And we as cranial sacral therapists can play a huge role in taking that out of our system. So often these kids are caught in that no man's land, what we just kind of talked about, you know, not getting the right diagnosis, not getting into the right therapies. Um, so we know, again, that cranial cervical can improve neurological function. So we've got this disorder here. <laughs> kind of like this. Um, ADD is basically ADHD without the hyperactivity part. <laughs> so Terms of ADD and ADHD are often used interchangeably for both those who do and those who do not have the symptoms of hyperactivity. So the official name is used by the American Psychi Psychiatric Association is Attention Deficit Hyperactivity Disorder, and that it encompasses hyperactivity, impulsive, and inattentive behavior. <laughs> but on the back, um, there's a couple ones that are in bold, and with distractibility and ADD, this is their primary problem. They cannot sustain attention and concentration. With ADHD, that's it's sort of a problem. They race from task to task. They get easily bored. They forget loose things. They miss information due to being distracted. With hyperactivity um, and ADD, due to the anxiety and not the ADHD motor-driven issue, they are driven and cannot relax. 
activities are not for excitement, but for relief from constant wandering and patterns of anxiety. With ADHD and hyperactivity, it's the primary problem. This is due to motor activity, not anxiety. They crave excitement and stimulation. And then with learning difficulties, information processing is poor with ADD, information is missed, slow cognition, weak reading, and spelling. With ADHD, they may have dyslexia because of a difference in brain functionality. They can often comprehend information but cannot make use of it. Teresa, what is this? Sorry, adding to this and extrapolating it to working with dyads, you will often be working with a mother coping with oh, these things super and good point. how she is processing the information that you're trying to bring into the circle of care. Yeah. Yeah. And I often find that, you know, a child with something like this, one or both parents is dealing with similar concerns. Teresa, I just wanted to make a note that for ADD, um, mm -hmm. one of the things that is, it's the primary um, symptom of celiac disease. Wow. And if a, just dietarily, if a child gets silly, or gets um, any of the proteins that mm -hmm. they're not assimilating, in order for them to start utilizing um, the nutrition that they're getting, it takes about 30 days of being gluten free. So. Does everybody hear that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Great. We're talking about gluten and um, ADD. ADD and both. Yeah, both. So there's a lot of components, mm -hmm. and we really don't know which one fits for each child or each adult. And it's also one of those overdiagnosed things because as you go from the west coast to east coast, it becomes epidemic about the time you hit Alabama. Yep. But the, uh -huh. the, it starts as really highly diagnosed. Midwest, West, and East Coast compared to the West Coast. 90% of the diagnoses are boys and 90% are urban boys. And so, and then also we have that parental thing because I can't tell you how many times we are asked to test children that are absolutely normal, mm -hmm. but the societal expectation yes. of what a child can do and where they should be, yes. it makes the diagnosis big because um, they're thinking, why can't my kid read when they're in kindergarten? Or why can't they sit down and do this thing? And that's a perfectly the normal developmental piece, but parents and you know, societal pressures that they do these things earlier. And there are really always good. sensory integration problems. There are always yes. sensory integration problems with this group. Always. Yeah. Oh, yeah, my little chart didn't come up. <laughs> <laughs> it was showing how sensory integration is in the middle and all these other conditions are interrelated to that. Um, okay. So I wrote at least that the frontal and parietal areas of the brain are involved in these conditions. So we know that the frontal lobe integrates all the information, parietal lobe processes sensory information, controls your coordination and your spatial awareness. So there is a chemical imbalance in the neurotransmitters. It affects the different lobes of the brain, and that does not allow for people to work at their full potential. But then we have the brain that heals. And we know that the brain is a dynamic organ. It is capable of changing. So the brain is not fixed in its hardwire. The neural circuits will modify the the way to future sights, sounds, and thoughts will be registered. <coughs> the location of a given function can move from one place to another. The brain actually changes its very structure with each different activity it performs. We know that the brain is most receptive to change while it's still developing in the preschool ages of three to five. Thus, the high hope of change for the better with the pervasive development. Dr. Upledger quoted with ADD, once you make the necessary cranial sacral therapy treatment, correction, symptoms will improve. In my initial series of treatments, I see patients um, I do three treatments quite soon together, um, either two within one week and then one in the next week or once a week for three weeks. And then I have an idea how they're going to progress with my treatment. 
and then I will set up um, treatment as needed. We could be continuing that way for a while if we've got a you know, moderate case. Um, then it becomes, I like to wean them off. I like to take it out to every other week, uh, once a month, then longer. And what I find is um, kids that have moved through that first year, then I only see them as needed. And the as needed means typically they are going through a hard time due to a change in their environment. And that environment can be the physical, emotional, So this is a kind of a cool book, um, The Golden Hat Club, written by Kate Winslet. And what she did is she did portraits of individuals with nonverbal autism and that have learned to communicate through typing. And what we know is they may not be able to communicate as we do, but they do understand. And here are a couple of the people in the book. So Josh was 25 when he was interviewed. He began communicating at age 19. The first thing he typed was try fully to understand my condition because I get so lonely. This made his mother very sad, of course. She knew he liked to be alone, but not that he was lonely. Mike, age 17, began communicating at age 11. Oops. He said to stop the war. It is killing too many soldiers. Mom was dumbfounded that he even had knowledge of the Iraq war. Carly, age 15, started communicating at age 11. She wrote, hurt, hurt, help. She got sore. I just got shat on. <laughs> I love the infant energy. <laughs> <laughs> but so, you know, writing her, her help, her parents were stunned and shocked. They had no idea that she was in that much pain. <laughs> Kelly, age 14, began communi communicating at age 10, and she said, I am real. And Mom suddenly realized that he had been listening to everything that was going on around him. And finally, Dove, age 19, began communicating at age 9. And he wrote, in response to the question below, what have you been doing all these years? He replied, listen. Can you say the author of that book again? Uh, Kate Winslet, the actress. It's called Golden Hat Club. So I want to end this with, and actually I'm going to go ahead because I get those in the wrong order. Um, this is Declan. And Declan came to me at age four. Um, he's age six now. And he had been severely physically abused by his father. Um, he had been kicked across the room as a toddler and hit his head. Um, grandma intervened at age four, and while dad was in jail and mom was in a heroin stupor, went and had her sign over parental rights. <laughs> um, he was very hyperactive um, and aggressive behavior. Um, he couldn't last in the preschools um, because eventually no kids would play with him. This isolated him. He became very angry and frustrated, acted out. So he presented to me with a very torqued sphenoid. Um, coronal suture was really jammed and he had plagiocephaly. That's just, you know, general information. <laughs> but, um, I like it. <laughs> um, I treated him with that protocol that I kind of mentioned, and he started uh, being able to function in preschool. Um, he was still not having a little trouble. Um, Grandma held him back a year going into first grade. Um, she got him into the art center which is a fabulous place in Portland um, with um, OTs, PTs, I believe, and psychologists. And then there's also Help ADD that's here. And um, these are brain retraining programs, getting right side and left side to talk to each other. And um, he flourished. 
And this is the last time I saw him about three weeks ago. So again, he's age six. Um, you know, very busy summer um, and getting ready to go into a new grade at school. So the really cool thing about these kids is as they get the treatment, they retain half their awareness of their body. And he now asks to come see me. So grandma, of course, will bring him when she recognizes some symptoms, but he often will say, it's time to go see the head doctor. <laughs> <laughs> Which I love. <laughs> so in this last session, um, about two thirds into the session, he moved into this pose all on his own. And grandma and I were kind of looking at each other, like, well, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. Then about 10 minutes into this, oops, I want to go the other way, shoot. He sat up, oh, and he did his movements. And I just continued to work on him for about 10 more minutes. And we ended the session, and we're like, so definitely what was going on, you know? And uh, we said, do you know yoga? And he's like, no. <laughs> well, were you meditating? No, I don't know what that is. <laughs> and he's very direct. Um, yeah, one time he told me I looked older than the last time I saw him. <laughs> uh, yeah, great thanks for that information. <laughs> but uh, so we just kind of probed him gently, like what was going on. And he said, this is what my body told me to do this. I did it. Um, and we said, well, what else was going on? He said, I saw this great purple light. Aww. And then we were done with the session. So I just want to impart to you guys that this work is awesome. And I hope you all start to kind of do more of it. Um, I'm just a neophyte in it. I don't have the, you know, the... Um, degrees to go behind all that great information that's out there, but I just, you know, parents are concerned, they've got a diagnosis, what can we do to help, and then I work from there. Yeah. I have a clinical question, maybe anyone in the room too, or, you know, um, I just had a friend email me last night and I said that her son, who's about two and a half, mm -hmm. is um, having some stuff come up at school, he just started preschool, mm -hmm. and he's kind of flapping his arms and his eyes are crossing. Well, I think that would be more of a question for Allison or Michelle. Um, obviously, something's going on. What? Or um, not Michelle. Oh. Yeah. Yeah. What? What's the question? The just that he's two and a half and he just started having this new behavior. Very cool with his arms. I guess he's flapping and he's crossing his eyes. Well, is, it, is it a new change for him? I guess so. I would say it's a processing issue, and that's you know, he's just coming. Okay. He's you know seeking sensory input. Like being under responsive, and it's just a way to calm. It's looked at as a stereotypical behavior a lot because a lot of people seek, but usually it's just saying he needs more proprioceptive, so like a hug or a squeeze or a tight spot, or hold something heavy on his lap, or carry something, or push something across the room. And sometimes I have a little bit of 
mm -hmm. oh gosh, the parent's going to wonder, am I really working on it? So how do you handle, how do you let the parent know that, yeah, this is yeah. still going to cost you for the full hour? <laughs> 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 really open so right. unfortunate so but. I kind of gauge that with them and I then I would say that we all have that energetic field and oftentimes things start in that and so children especially are very um, they feel that quite easily mm -hmm. and so we can just start there mm -hmm. and they can start to let me in and then about the not having hands on them very often I just say you know a lot of work is done in short first time and they, on the times that I don't have my hands on them, they are integrated. Yeah, I, tell, I tell parents that, that um, this is, when, when I'm in one of those sessions where I don't have my hands on a kid very much, I'll say, you know, this is a really normal treatment for a child this age. This is the way it looks. Um, that, that it doesn't take a lot of hands-on time. And just so, you know, that's what, and I say, that's why I allow an hour so that I can get 10 minutes of hands-on time with, with a child's consent, because that's all they need. And that's, so, yeah. Yeah, it's being confident. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was going to say, too, make sure you give the parent an experience themselves. If they've never had cranial work and never felt you come into their energy field, give them an experience of that, and that's usually all they need. Oh, especially for a new mom, it's a tiny bit, and they're like, oh my god, I need to set up a session. <laughs> you get it. Awesome. I do that a lot when I work on the mom, the kid's not into it, and then eventually mm. the kid's like, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Those are all super. Anything else? So we're going to um, do some table work now, and we're going to do a little role playing. The child has a mild behavioral outburst at preschool. They show anger, and when they can't be first in line in an activity, they still um, <coughs> do not sit still very well during learning activities. So I didn't go into the whole um, category of what, what's going on, so this just tells me something's going on. And so for me, it's just about doing the work. So. Um, if they have a diagnosis, great, we can talk about that, but I will refer out for, you know, the real medical questions. So what we're going to do is we're going to have one person um, be the patient, and the scenario is that this child will most likely want to sit on the table, but you as the therapist can see if they will want to lie down, and you can play with how to do that with somebody. Um, the child's going to move their body a lot and reposition frequently. Um, they're going to do that about every minute or so. And you as a therapist can see if you need to bring them back to the position they were or if you're comfortable letting them go where they want to go. Then from that, as they move around, feel how you need to adapt your positioning to work on them. The little child on the table is going to talk continuously to you. <laughs> They're going to tell you about their favorite show, so you guys can kind of think of a kid's show that you know about. And you as a therapist have to kind of decide, is this talking going to distract you? Do you feel like you need to quiet them down? Um, and there's no right or wrong here, so just go ahead and start. So one of you decides to be the little three-year-old. One of you decides to be the therapist. <laughs> And, um, do one more scenario. Um, patient's going to be six years old. They're easygoing but somewhat withdrawn. They really like to, they don't really like to look in your eyes. They're very outspoken about what they know. They ask you how old you are, why you're doing what you're doing. They tell you they're in the first grade. They like to build airplanes, you like to build airplanes, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, they'll lie pretty still for you. In a few minutes into the session, they move the placement of your hands into another position. And then you decide what you're going to do from there. Then the last thing they're going to want to do is they're going to want to roll over and you need to figure out how to work with that. 
I saw some great role playing, everybody. Thank you for being willing to participate in that. I know some people find role playing challenging, but I really think it helps you embody those little people that you're going to be working with. Um, thank you for participating in the whole uh, lecture. Um, so, like Carol mentioned, I'm going to be moving into teaching this probably the first part of next year. I'm going to coordinate with Carol when we can get that going. I won't be in the class. Girls in the class. Yeah, so. me too. Thank you, everybody.